Last week, uh, our sermon was titled Backgrounds. And we spoke about how in every moment of our life, God is in the background working things out for our favor. He's working things out for his glory. He's working things out for your good. And how in the background, he has already ordained people to say yes to you. Yes, you're hired. Yes, you're approved. Yes, you're accepted. Yes, your case has been dismissed on your behalf. And there are people that he has ordained that you may have met already or may have not even met, but he's working in the background of your life because he loves you and working out for your success and for the glory of his kingdom. So in this background of our life, our redemption, our salvation, our prosperity, and even our posterity is something that God is working out these events. He orchestrates events. He orchestrates people. He even orchestrates at times will allow tragedies to play a part. I remember when uh, there's a gentleman named Ryan Panariso, who's a good friend of mine, and he lives in Colorado. And I met Ryan outside of the church in the amphitheater. We had a loan with Broadway Bank, and Broadway Bank um, called one day and said, you know what, we're not really sure about the loan that we gave you. Um, so, um, Able, the contractor, went into the bank and said, uh, we want to increase our loan from $850,000 to a million dollars because we've decided we want to put a parking lot. And the uh, bank officer at Broadway Bank said, uh, okay, but now that you're taking the loan to a million, you've got to go before a different committee. So we had to reapply all over again. And we were having trouble because we hadn't had our property uh, platted. That's something that should take maybe three to six months, um, two, three months like that. And it was taking too long. And so the bank, they said, well, we're not, we're not only not going to give you a million dollars, we're not even going to give you what we said we would give you in the beginning, <laughs> which was the 850000 We've already loaned you two fifty, but we want that two fifty back, and you need to go to another bank. So I was like... Once again, like, oh, Jesus, you know, help us. And it was uh, around the time, 2014, the banks were reeling from the crash of 2008 and 2009, that housing crash. Incidentally, it was, it was funny to me that our own bank, Frost Bank, didn't even want to meet with us, didn't even come out here. We had been banking with them for 20 years, and they didn't even offer to call us back. They frankly said, we're not really loaning money right now, especially to churches, especially to churches that have Mexican Puerto Rican pastors. <laughs> I said, okay. And Broadway was the one in San Antonio that had the worst reputation for being the strictest. They were strict and they, everybody told me, Broadway, man, they, they want your mother's DNA, your father's DNA, and they're going to do, uh, you know, your ancestry.com. They're just so strict. And they said yes to us. I'm like, well, when, when God is for something, nobody can be against it. But then they changed their mind. So I was like, man, I was like, where are we going to get the $250,000 to pay them back? I mean, if they wanted to repossess the foundation, go for it. <laughs> it's huge foundation. I'd like to see them take that back. <laughs> we're going to get the 250. Not only are we going to get the 250 to pay them back, we're going to get the rest of the money to finish the building. So Randolph Brooks said, okay, I'll meet with you. Ryan is a young, skinny, tall guy. He came out there. He was like real serious. And I was like, oh, Jesus, please, you know, help us. And he said, Pastor Belton. Do you think you can finish this building with $650,000? I said, yes. <laughs> and I know that was the spirit of God inside of me because up here there's a no, heck no. <laughs> I almost said, hell no. <laughs> and hell's in the Bible. <laughs> yeah, somewhere in there. <laughs> and I said, yes, we can. And then he said, okay. And then he said, you know what? God's going to bless you. 
And, and he started revealing that he was a believer in the Lord. And then I said, man, that's awesome. And then ever since that point, we never talked about money. We always talked about the Lord every time I'd call him and stuff. Hey, Pastor Belton, pray for this and pray for that. And, and um, well, we, we did pay the 250 back. We did finish the building with the remaining a few thousand, hundred thousand dollars because people kept kicking money in and we just, the Lord just brought us to where we're at right now. And um, I've been in touch with Ryan and, and Ryan stayed in San Antonio for just a few months. Then he went to Dallas. They used him to open up banks, you know, in the Dallas area. And uh, he was doing really well. And then last time I checked with him, he was back in Colorado. He said, Pastor Belton, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a president of a bank now. You know, he said, and that's my dream, and that's my, and I'm getting married uh, in a month or two. He said, I remember I told my mother when I was five years old that I wanted to be a bank president. <laughs> I, I was thinking, you little nerd. <laughs> Who's thinking about being a bank president at five years old? But he got his dream, you know, and I told him, you know what, Ryan, I take it personally that you came all the way to Texas because I feel like you came just to approve our loan. <laughs> I took that personally. God's got stuff in the background people in the background, incidences in the back, circumstances in the background that are meant to help you and work things out in your favor. Amen. Amen. There are people that he's ordained to help you. See, God is not just sitting idly by about you. Can you say amen? amen? He's active, he's involved, he's taking action on your behalf because he loves you. Now, <clears throat> I'm glad I was thinking that God doesn't think about me as much as I think about him. Can you, can you imagine? If God thought about you just as much as you thought about him, we'd be in trouble, wouldn't we? But God is always thinking about you. He's active. He's involved. He loves you. And uh, a lot of people don't appreciate that. They don't realize that because they're not used to people paying attention to them. They're used to being ignored. They're not used to being chased. They're not used to people wanting their company but I want to tell you, the Bible tells us in Luke that Jesus cares so much about us that even the hairs on our head are numbered. He was talking to the disciples and he goes, you know, you can buy five sparrows for two pennies. And even as cheap as those five sparrows are, God has not forgotten one of them. And then he looked at his disciples and he said, don't fear anything because you are far more valuable than those sparrows, amen? Deuteronomy 31 verse eight says this, and the Lord, he is the one who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. Modern day translation, I got this. Allow me to invite you to listen in on a conversation that this same God who loves you right now was having with someone else he loved. Note the passion and the commitment that exists. Note the level of loyalty that he expresses. We find his words in Isaiah 43, verse 1 and 2. But now, says the Lord who created you, O Jacob, and he formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk to the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you. This is the same God that spoke those words that loves you today. He's the same God that is committed to you today. This is the same God that is working on your behalf today. This is the same God that is willing to confront your enemies today. So while you and I are being terribly distracted by what is in front of us, while we're focused on our battles, while we're focused and concentrating on our circumstances and our situations, while we're being led by our problems and not our promises, while our emotions are raging and tossing and our, our loyalties are to and fro, God is always working in the background of our lives to accomplish his will, to reveal his glory working things out on your behalf. Look at your neighbor and say, because he loves you, he's already worked it out. Here he is again, speaking on his own behalf about what he plans on doing for one of his servants. We find this powerful declaration in Isaiah 45, one through five. This is what the Lord says to his anointed, to Cyrus. 
whose right hand I take hold of to subdue nations before him and to strip kings of their armor, to open doors before him so that the gates will not be shut. I will go before you and I will level the mountains. I will break down gates of bronze and cut through bars of iron. I will give you hidden treasures, riches stored in secret places so that you may know that I am the Lord, the God of Israel who summons you by name. For the sake of Jacob, my servant of Israel, my chosen, I summon you by name and bestow on you a title of honor. Though you do not acknowledge me, I am the Lord and there is no other apart from me. There is no God. I will strengthen you, though you have not acknowledged me. Cyrus was, the Bible says, a man that was a pagan king. He wasn't even Jewish or part of the Israelites. He was pagan. And the Bible mentions King Cyrus 30 times in the Bible. He reigned over Persia between 539, uh, between 530 and 539 BC. He's referred to a pagan, but he's important in Jewish history because it was under his rule that the Jews were first allowed to return to Israel after 70 years of captivity. 150 years before King Cyrus lived, the prophet calls him by name and gives details of King Cyrus. He gives details of the benevolence to the Jews. This is what the Lord says to his anointed, to Cyrus. He mentions his name, whose right hand I take. I take hold of his right hand and subdue nations before him. I summon you by name and bestow upon you a title of honor. His sovereignty over all the nations was declared in that prophetic message. He even calls Cyrus a shepherd. And, will, and he says, I will accomplish all that I please. He's got the whole world in his hands. Can you say amen? amen? He's got control over that thing that keeps you up at night. He's got control over those people that are harassing you and menacing you. He's got control over that court case. He's got control over your own uh, situation. That, that he, and he even has defeated the enemy. He's gone before you. And he's even controlling the enemy in our lives. Cyrus decrees released to the Jewish people in fulfillment of that prophecy. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, the king of Persia, and he made a proclamation. Listen to what this king says that's not even uh, part of the Jewish nation. He says, thus saith Cyrus, the king of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven has given me all the kingdoms of the earth and he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever is among you of all his people, may the Lord his God be with him. Let him go up. And King Cyrus actively assisted with the Jews at rebuilding the temple in Jerusalem under Zerubbabel and Joshua the high priest. And Cyrus restored the temple treasures to Jerusalem and he even allowed building expenses to be paid from the royal treasury. Cyrus's beneficence helped to restart the temple worship practice that had languished during the 70 years of Jewish captivity. He's called the shepherd for his people. And the king's heart, the Proverbs 21 says, the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. He directs it like a water course wherever he pleases. Can you imagine that? Your daddy holds all the king's hearts in his hand and directs them. And so when Putin starts mouthing off about what he's going to do and what he's going to destroy, excuse me, Mr. Putin, you can't do anything unless God allows you to do it. Because my daddy holds your heart in his hand and he directs it like a water course. Mr. Chi from China, you're not in control. You desire control, but you're not in control. God is in control. He's in control of the United States. He's in control of everything. And you know what? God's in control of that boss that's been picking at you at work or that teacher that's messing with you at school or that neighbor that's fighting with you. He's in control of everything. And he's in the background of your life working things out for your good. Now, I want to encourage you with two things today, two things that the Bible talks to us about and gives us a lot of hope about our situations Lately, I've been feeling like God's been saying, you know, um, you can experience victory to a greater degree if you change your focus, if you allow or align your, your vision to go higher than what it is right now. 
Because you and I have a tendency to look at what's in, in, our, in front of us and, and around us. And, 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 and I, I believe God's saying if we want to experience victory and, and the deliverance that Pastor T.C. was talking about, we need to focus more on who God is and less on what we're going through. We need to focus more on what God has promised than what the enemy's trying to, the, the trouble that the enemy's trying to stir up. And when we concentrate on who God is and we concentrate on his promises and we get into his character and we learn how much he loves us and how powerful he is, then that liberates us from a lot of anxiety, a lot of worries when we know these things. And so um, it is that I want to encourage you with two things here today. And uh, the first one is that the Bible says that a righteous man, his steps are ordered of the Lord. The steps of a righteous man are ordered of the Lord. Who, who's righteous? You're righteous if you have accepted Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. That's, that's, that makes you righteous. Now, if you are focused on your behavior, um, you will miss this and you will miss this blessing because you will not apply this promise to yourself. But if you allow yourself and look above your behavior, look above your emotions, look above and look uh, are, are above the things that you're going through and, and concentrate on what God says, it says that the steps of a righteous man, a righteous woman are ordered of the Lord. So do you see yourself as righteous today? If you're righteous, then I want to tell you your steps are ordered of the Lord. Psalms 37, 23, the Lord makes firm the steps of the one who delights in him. It's another translation says the Lord directs the steps of the godly. He delights in every detail of their lives. Another version says the steps of a man are established by the Lord and he delights in his way. In Psalms 37, David writes that the righteous can trust God to sustain them. In verse 17, he, he writes that the inheritance of the righteous will never end. In verse 18, in chapter 37, he talks that the righteous are given righteousness and salvation from the Lord. There's a verse that says, salvation belongs to our God. In Psalms 37, 39, it says uh, that it's a psalm that reminds us that God's faithfulness of his faithfulness encourages us that we can trust in him and that he's worthy of our trust. And then in 23, as we read, he says that the steps of a righteous man are ordered of the Lord. Earlier in the book of Psalms, David explains that when we commit our way to the Lord, he will bring about our righteousness. David proclaims that God orders or directs even the individual steps that a person takes and that God delights in our steps. And that word order there in that verse comes from a Hebrew word that means to guide, to make reliable, to direct. So if you have accepted Jesus Christ as your personal savior, I want to tell you that he's guiding you if you let him. He's making things reliable if you allow him. He's directing your steps. In other words, the person who com who cause who's committed to to God's ways will have his steps made sure by God. <clears throat> it's encouraging to know that they are solid steps. It's encouraging to know that even our small, seemingly inconsequential steps are not too insignificant for God. He loves and cares for us so much that he actually takes pleasure in guiding our steps. When we fall, Psalms tells us, we won't fall to destruction because the Lord holds our hand. Because the law of God is in our hearts, our steps or our path won't be slippery. What an incredible truth to know that God is right there, that he's, he's established our walk if we simply commit our walk to him. Even more incredible perhaps is that he delights in doing that. To think that the almighty God, all creator, takes pleasure in walking with each of his people in that way. I've learned all these years to trust more in God and to trust less in my emotions and what I'm feeling and even to trust less in the ability that the enemy has to destroy my life. 
Because I've seen God bail me out time and time and time again. Can you say amen? I've seen how God in one moment can silence the enemy or reverse all the all the destruction that the enemy has caused if God opens his mouth. And, I, and I'm beginning to understand how God is on in my behalf and I'm beginning to understand that I'm the righteousness of Christ through faith in Jesus. And that it's, 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 I'm disconnecting my righteousness that God has given me and bestowed upon me uh, from my behavior because for years and years and years I would not, I would disqualify myself because I would like, well that happens to good Christians or that happens to Christians that know their Bible or Christians that, and, and I, I fail to make the connect. Now, get, don't get me wrong, everything that God does for you on your behalf is not based on your behavior. It's based on his love for you. But I will tell you what your behavior is based on. Your behavior signals to God the level of participation you desire God to have in your life. I'm going to say that again. Your behavior and how you behave signals to God the level of participation you desire for him to have in your life. The Bible says, if, see, see, he loves us and he blesses us, amen? And so we love him and we ought to bless him. And how do you bless the Lord? You bless him by honoring him, you bless him by praising him, and you bless him by obeying him. Amen. He tells us, if you, Jesus says, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. And so it's good to know that every step that I take is order of the Lord. And there are times when I get my own self in trouble or there are times when I'm feeling some kind of funky stuff and I just sit there and I say, you know what? It's going to work out. There's sometimes I have conversations with the devil and I say, you know what? <laughs> Your time is up. Your time is limited. My daddy's coming for me. And I know how much he loves you, me. And, and I'm a righteous man. So you, you only have a little bit more time to mess with me. But what you're doing right now is not to my destruction because you're defeated. Amen. And so that encourages me and the older I get, the more confident I get, the more I know God's going to work things. There's a story in Isaiah 59 where the prophet is talking to the, 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 the nation, the nation of Israel. And they're in deep sin. They're just totally ignoring God. They're doing all kinds of, I encourage you to go home and read Isaiah 59. And the prophet is, is, is just going on about their behavior. And he's even listing all the horrible things that are happening. Truth has fallen in the streets. Those who sought to do right were oppressed and harassed. And then verse 15 says, the Lord saw this and he was displeased that there was no justice in the land. And then in verse 16, the prophet writes, God saw that there was no man, no intercessor. Earlier in the history of this nation, there was intercessors like Moses and Joshua and David. But with these new people Isaiah was writing about in that time, God saw no intercessor. So God takes matters into his own hands. The last part of verse 16 in chapter 59, he says, therefore his own, own, his own arm brought salvation for him. Now we're talking about prophetic view and a prophetic announcement that Jesus was going to come and handle our sin problem. Therefore his own arm brought salvation for him and his own righteousness which is the righteousness of God, is, it sustained him. Jehovah would act personally depending on none other than himself and his own arm of strength to intercede and bring his people into a right relationship with God. God would uphold his own cause and his own righteousness directly without even intercessors. And then the next picture is God putting on his armor for battle. For he put on, the Bible says in Isaiah, for he put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation for his, on his head. He put on the garments of vengeance for clothing and was clad with zeal as a cloak according to their deeds. 
according to he will repay fury to his adversaries and recompense to his enemies. The coastlands he will fully repay, so shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. It's the verse I want to leave you with. When the enemy comes in like a flood, if you are righteous and you belong to him, the spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against the enemy. In the background of your life, as you're going through marital problems, you're going through financial problems, you're going through physical problems, you're going through personal addictions, you're going through turmoil, and the enemy seems to be coming at you like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord doesn't stand idly by, but the Spirit of the Lord lifts up a standard against your enemy if you are the righteous of God, if you belong to the Lord. This was during the age before Jesus came and this was God's response to the sin that Isaiah was describing. It was a, a response to justice and vengeance. And then verse 18 says, according to their deeds, it involved recompense to his enemies. So we understand that there comes a time when you might be uh, going through some stuff and then the enemy just throws all this stuff at you. And if you belong to him, he is going to come in and he's going <clears> to... <throat> Like, like a flood, rise up a standard against your enemy if you are the righteousness of God, if you say yes to God. At that time, there was no intercessor and God just told the prophet Isaiah, I'm doing this on my own. Verse 20 of Isaiah 59 says, the redeemer will come to Zion. This is the Christ. This is the Messiah. And everything in Isaiah 59 from verses 1 through 19, demonstrate the need for a redeemer. The theme of the chapter is your iniquities have separated you from God. Our sin separates us from God. Our iniquities separates our, uh, us from God. But the Bible says that his hand is not too short to save. His ear is not too heavy to hear. He sees you like Pastor T.C. was saying prophetically. He sees you where you're at. He sees you where you're at. And he knows you. And like... Uh, like Jesse was talking about our own Babylons, our own areas of captivity, our own areas where we feel stuck or where we're, 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 our own sin separates us from God. I want you to know God is still in the background. He is, he just, you, you, can, you can almost hear footsteps coming towards you. He's your redeemer Amen. and your redeemer lives. And even if you're not praying, even if no one's helping you out, whatever, because you said yes to him, because you are his son, his daughter, because you have decided to become the righteousness of Christ. And back then, G, back then the prophet said that God was putting on the breastplate of righteousness and he was putting on the helmet of salvation. And it reminds me in, in the New Testament where Paul says to uh, put on the full armor of God. And Paul talks about a breastplate of righteousness and a, a helmet of salvation. It reminds me also of, of little David when uh, King Saul was trying to prepare him for battle and he gave him, him his suit. He said, here, put this on, you're going to need it. And David said, this does not fit me well. Your, your breastplate and, and, and your, your armor does not fit me well. He said, I can't use this. But there's another king that has uh, uh, armor for us to wear against our enemies, and that's the breastplate of righteousness. And that means that it's his breastplate of righteousness that he lets you wear. It's not your own breastplate of righteousness because you and I cannot do anything good enough and we have no righteousness within us. So when you put on the breastplate of righteousness that Paul tells you to put on, it's not your good works. It's not the way you behave. It's not all the Bible verses you memorize or the number of times you go to church, the money you give, but it's the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And when he says, put on the helmet of salvation, you have to cover your mind with, with, with the salvation of God. You have to understand what it entails and what it means. And, and it's his salvation that you put on your head to protect your mind and your thoughts from the enemy. Because if not, he'll come at your, at your mind and he'll, he'll try to destroy you through your mind. He'll try to separate you and keep you separated from God because maybe at times of your own sin. And so he pledged to, to save the nation. And he says, the Redeemer will come to Zion. And those who turn from transgression. 
As for me, says the Lord, this is my covenant with them. And this is his covenant with you. My spirit who is upon you and my words which I have put in your mouth shall not depart from your mouth, nor from the mouth of your descendants, nor from the mouth of your descendants' descendants, says the Lord, from this time and forevermore. That's a bold statement that he's saying. That if you belong to him and you've said yes to Christ and you're his righteousness, he says, my words and my covenant with you, they won't depart from you. My spirit who is upon you and my words which I have put in your mouth shall not depart from your mouth, not from the mouth of your descendants, not from the mouth of your descendants, descendants. Says the Lord from this time and forever. How many of you know that's a sure thing there? It's a sure covenant with God, amen. The devil tries to make you think, you know, oh, you're, you're beyond help or you're getting too cold or, or you know, you're, 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 you're going to stray away and God has made you a promise that if you're really his, his words are not going to depart from your mouth and his spirit will not depart from you. And it talks about a redeemer. In the Bible, we see the, the concept in Israel of a kinsman redeemer, which is a goel, G-O-E-L. And the goel sometimes translates into this kin, kinsman redeemer and it's simply a redeemer and the bible tells us that jesus is our redeemer and the redeemer in the role of israel's family life had a purpose the redeemer was responsible to buy a fellow israel israelite out of slavery so if i was your kinsman redeemer i would pay a price and pay you pay the person that had you in slavery, pay the price and get you out of slavery. He was also responsible to be the avenger of blood, to make sure that if somebody in the family was murdered, that that family member had to answer to the crime. The kinsman redeemer was also responsible to buy back family land and land that had been lost or forfeited. And the kinsman redeemer at times was responsible to carry the family name by marrying a childless widow. In this we see that the Goel, or the kinsman redeemer, was responsible to safeguard the persons, the property, and the posterity of the family. This is the work of God on your behalf. These plans of God for you are there as well. Jesse alluded to a verse in Jeremiah that said, I know the plans that I have for you. They're to prosper you, not, not for failure. They're not based on your behavior. They're based, they're based on his love for you. Your, your behavior does play a part on his response to you, but what he does for you is based on the fact that he loves you so much. God blesses you and he loves you and our natural response to his love is to bless him back and to honor him and to worship him. And I want to say this, the only power that the devil has in your life is the power you give him. Say that again. The only power that the devil has in your life is the power that you give him. You give the devil power through inactivity. You give the devil power through ignorance. And you give the devil power through disobedience. Inactivity, you don't pray, you don't read the Bible, you don't come to church, you don't fellowship. Ignorance, you don't do the things that are necessary to get to know God. Disobedience, you ignore the paths and the instructions that he has charted out for you and you do what's contrary. So I believe that we all have an ability to walk out this victory that was purchased for us at Calvary. And we have to put on our breastplate of righteousness and we know we're not going out there in our own strength and our own good behavior or morality. There's, there's a lot of good people out there. There's a lot of people that know how to behave and they behave good, but that won't get you into heaven and that won't get you saved. That doesn't get you into a good relationship with Christ. It's acknowledging that he is your savior, acknowledging that he is your redeemer, acknowledging that he is your righteousness. So in the background of your life, even at this moment, God is working things out in a very powerful way on your behalf, for his honor, for his glory, and for your good because he loves you so much. In the background. 
And the Bible tells us, as we've read, that your steps, if you've said yes to Christ, every one of your steps are ordered of the Lord. He's willing to talk to you about everything. He's willing to counsel you. When you go to the far, to the left, he brings you towards the center. He's there to bring you back to the right steps. And he's your kinsman redeemer. He will restore. He will redeem. He will purchase. Uh, he will get back. The Bible says he will restore what the canker worm has eaten and all that you have lost a hundredfold. Would you stand with me this afternoon or this morning? I'm going to just invite you to elevate what God has promised you in his word to elevate and to focus on what God has done and is doing on your behalf to take the time and to give yourself permission to ignore your emotions to ignore your circumstances and your and your your feelings what makes you unhappy what makes you angry and to reach up high enough to God's throne to his heart and to his mind to in to allow yourself to submit yourself to become the husband that God wants you to be or that he will empower you to become the father that God will empower you to become the son of God the Christian that God will empower you to become to elevate your eyesight to the king of kings and the Lord of Lords and you watch how much we will be able to experience more victory and, and more deliv deliverance and more liberty as we make him the center of our lives. He said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to me. Our distraction and your distraction is we still want to have fun. We still like doing this. We still like doing that. We still like pleasure. We, like, we still like entertaining ourselves. We still like to get back at people that get at us. Your key to victory and a supernatural life in God is to just submit to the Lord and to humble ourselves. And to say what David said, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. It's not my job that's going to determine my happiness, not my ministry, not the size of the church, not who's faithful to me or who's, who's talking behind my back. None of those things will determine my, my happiness, but my happiness and my joy will be determined by the Lord himself. Can you make that decision today? Can we make that our starting point? And I don't know how you came to church, if something was bothering you, oppressing you, or you were missing something, but I'm here to tell you, you're not missing anything. His name is Jesus Christ, and he's able to help you, and he's your kinsman redeemer right now. So put the devil back in his place today. When you put God in his place, you put the devil in his place. Father, we come before you and we thank you, Lord, that you have spoken to us in your word about how much love you have for us and how that love motivates you to work on our behalf in the backgrounds of our life. And yet all the while we're focusing on what we don't have and how I need this money, how I need this job, how I need this car, how this person made me mad, how our, our emotions are just like roller coasters, Father. We're focusing on those things that are in front of us and around us, Lord, that we would come to understand that you're a God that has gone before us and you're to the right and to the left of us in front of us and behind us and in the background of our life even as of now you have everything in place for our success and our survival and for us to enjoy the liberty and the salvation you have purchased for us help us to focus on that help us to give attention that is des deserved to your word and to your presence Lord. thank you for ordering our steps thank you for even working with us and telling us where to go and what to think and what to say and, and guiding our every step and taking delight in every detail of our life, Father. And thank you, Father, that your hand is not too short to save us. Your ear is not too heavy to not hear our cry for help, Lord. And that you yourself will come down with the breastplate of righteousness and a helmet of salvation like you did in Isaiah. You said there was no man caring about praying there was nobody really concerned about righteousness but you would not want us to be separated from you so you you said I'm gonna do this myself I'm coming down myself and I'm gonna take care of business I'm gonna put on a 
breastplate of righteousness. You gave us a picture of Christ to come. And now, Father, you're asking us to equip ourselves and to wear those same, uh, our, that same armor that protects us from the fiery darts of the enemy, that protects our minds. We would continue to put on the breastplate of righteousness, not our righteousness, not the way we behave or the good things we do, but your righteousness that was purchased at Calvary. The helmet of salvation, not the religion that we know, not the, the things that people tell us. If you do this, you're going to be saved. If you do that, you're going to be lost. But the, the, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the helmet of salvation that belongs to you, help us to put that to cover our minds, Lord, so we can uh, survive the attacks of the enemy. He's, he badgers us with thoughts, wrong thoughts. We get angry, we get moody, we get depressed, we become insecure, afraid. There's so many times your word tells us, do not fear, do not fear, do not fear. Why? You tell us not to fear, not because things are going to work out or we're going to be able to figure everything out, but you always tell us not to fear because you're with us. And that's the key and that's the answer, that you are with us. And that if you're with us because you love us, you are going to protect us and you're going to secure our survival. And time and time you've told every nation and prophet of yours and every believer and even in this house today, don't be afraid. I'm with you. I'm not going to leave you. I'm not going to forsake you. Maybe a man will, a company will, a pastor, church will, a friend will, but I, the Lord your God, will never leave you. Even when the devil's right there in your very house and you're even sleeping with the enemy, God says, I will not leave you. My hand is not too short to save you. And my ear is attentive to your cry. If you cry out to me, if you repent, if you reach out to me, you'll have the full package and all the benefits that come with my presence. Don't stay in your sin. We, you, you, you cry out to us, Lord, in your word. For us not to stay in our sin. For us not to stay departed from you or to have your face hidden from us. Encourage us, Father, through the power of your presence, Lord. Speak to our hearts, speak to us in dreams, Lord. Strengthen every weak marriage, strengthen every um, weak economy, strengthen every weak body. And Father, give us that power that comes with the promise of your presence in our life. And we give you all the honor and we give you all the glory. And we ask these things in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen.